Hi, this is Matt Baker. Today I'm going to explain the various branches of Islam. Around 85% of Muslims in the world today belong to the Sunni branch, which is generally considered to be the mainstream Islam. However, the remaining 15% belong to Shiaism and are called Shias. Shias form the majority in countries such as Iran and Iraq and form sizable minorities in other Muslim countries as well. In this video, we're going to take a look at the differences between Shias and Sunnis, as well as the family tree of the various Shia Imams, and how this led to even more divisions. In the end, I'll also talk briefly about the third main sect of Islam as well. So the main schism between Shias and Sunnis began as a political divide, not a religious one. To explain the early history of the divide, I'm going to use our Asian royal family trees chart, which is available as a poster on our website, usefulcharts.com. As I'm sure you know, the religion of Islam was founded by a man named Muhammad, who was both a religious leader, but also a political leader. When he passed away in 632, he left behind a pretty sizable empire, which controlled most of Arabia. According to the Sunnis, Muhammad left no designated successor. Since he didn't have any sons that survived early childhood, there was a succession crisis. In the chaos after his death, his close friend and father-in-law, Abu Bakr, was chosen as caliph, a word that literally just means successor. Ali, the Prophet's closest living male relative, was completely sidelined. You can see here that he was a cousin of the Prophet, and he was also married to Fatima, the Prophet's daughter. So many Muslims at the time believed that Ali deserved the caliphate. According to Shias, Muhammad had actually declared Ali to be his political successor, but Sunnis dispute this. Ali was overlooked for the caliphate twice more. When Abu Bakr died, Umar succeeded him, and then after him, Uthman. It was only when Uthman died in 655 that Ali finally came to power. So basically, this is where the divide between the Shias and the Sunnis begins. Sunnis venerate all the companions of the Prophet and consider them all to have been pious Muslims. Shias, however, don't believe this. They see Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman as not only usurpers who stole the caliphate from Ali, but also as oppressors. They don't see them as legitimate caliphs. For them, Ali was the first caliph, not the fourth. Okay, let's now talk about the theological ramifications of this divide. Of course, at the center of Islam is the Quran, which Muslims consider to be the verbatim word of God. However, when it comes to interpreting the Quran, Sunnis and Shias go to separate sources. Since Sunnis respect all companions, meaning anyone who followed Muhammad during his lifetime, they can rely on what the companions said about Muhammad's sayings and actions. These sayings and actions form something called the Hadiths, and these serve as the core of Islamic law, also known as Sharia. However, for Shias, that's not really an option since they see a lot of the companions as being corrupt men who opposed and oppressed Ali. So they largely rely on the imams for jurisprudence. Imam literally just means leader or guide. In addition to the imams, they also follow hadiths, but only those narrated by the companions who sided with Ali. Sunnis have imams as well. But for Sunnis, an imam is just any man who has studied the Quran and the Hadith deeply and has made a large contribution to Islam, maybe in the form of compiling the Hadiths or expanding on the Sharia. However, for Shias, imams have to be descendants of Muhammad. Also, for Sunnis, imams can be wrong or mistaken. But for Shias, imams are infallible and divinely guided. Finally, for Sunnis, there is the concept of ijma, meaning consensus. A number of scholars can debate and reach a conclusion on a particular problem. 
But for Shias, the imam's word is the final word. Sunnis have four main schools of jurisprudence based on four famous imams. Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam As-Shafi'i, and Imam Ibn Hanbal. These four schools have their own divisions that branched off later, but in general, there are four. However, for Shias, there's only one main school, and that was the one founded by Imam Jafar as Sadiq. We'll get to him in a sec. Let's now take a look at the family tree of Shia Imams. So the family tree of the Shia Imams begins with Ali, the first Imam. You can see here that both Muhammad and Ali descend from a man named Hashim, their great-grandfather. It's because of him that the family of Muhammad is often called the Hashemites. It's also from him that the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan gets its name. The ruling dynasty there claims descent from Muhammad through his grandson Al-Hassan. Another dynasty that was Hashemite was the Abbasid dynasty, which ruled the Abbasid Caliphate from 750 to 1258. We have a separate video on them that you should certainly check out. Returning to Ali, Ali had two sons with Fatima, Al-Hassan and Al-Hussein. As I mentioned, Ali was skipped over for the caliphate three times, but finally came to power after the death of Uthman in 655. His reign was marked by a civil war between him and a man named Muawiyah. Ali was assassinated in 661, at which point his eldest son, Al-Hassan, became the second imam. Some people consider Al-Hassan to be the next rightful caliph. However, he actually abdicated the caliphate in favor of Muawiyah in order to end the civil war. After this, he mostly retired from public life until his death in 670. Shias believe that he was poisoned by Muawiyah. At this point, Al-Hassan's younger brother, Al-Hussein, became the third imam. Unlike his brother, Al-Hussein was more interested in public life. When Muawiyah died in 680, Al-Hussein came to the forefront of the political drama that was about to engulf the Islamic Caliphate. Muawiyah chose his son Yazid to be his heir. This was the first hereditary appointment of a caliph, and it was seen as extremely un-Islamic, as it would lead to the formation of an official dynasty, which became known as the Umayyad dynasty. Al-Hussein refused to swear allegiance to the Umayyads, and as a result, he was killed in the Battle of Karbala in 680. The events of the Kabbalah have been hugely commemorated to such an extent that the anniversary of the battle is still observed all over the Islamic world, and Hussein is venerated as a great innocent martyr. Among the survivors of the battle was Al-Hussein's son, Ali ibn Al-Hussein, who became the fourth imam. He is the last of the imams that are considered to be an imam by all Shias. At this point, imams became secluded and didn't take part in politics, for the most part. Instead, they lived quiet lives in Medina, or Mecca, and passed on their teaching to their pupils, who eventually formed the corpus of the Shia faith. Ali ibn al-Hussein's death marks the beginning of the first schism within the Shia community. The first branch here is the Zaidi Shias. They consider Zaid ibn Ali to be the fifth imam. He rebelled against the Umayyad Caliphate and was killed, but he is still considered to have been a legitimate caliph by the Zaidi Shias. He stands in contrast to the Twelver imams as being militant and not spending a quiet life of patience and teaching. Instead, he wanted to overthrow the oppressive Umayyad rule. In fact, to this day, you see the spirit of fighting for what's right among the Zaidis. They formed various empires throughout the Islamic world, primarily on the periphery in areas such as northern Iran, Morocco, and Yemen. They're still found in Yemen in large numbers. In fact, the Houthi movement, which is a major player in the Yemeni civil war, is primarily a Zaidi group. Among other Shia groups, Ali ibn al-Hussein's other son, Muhammad al-Bakir, is considered the fifth imam. 
he lived a quiet life in Medina and passed away in 732. He was succeeded by Jafar as Sadiq as the sixth Imam. He lived during the time when power shifted from the Umayyad dynasty to the Abbasid dynasty, which was also the period in which the various Sunni schools of law developed. As a result, he developed his own school, known as the Jafari school. It wouldn't be wrong to say that Jafar as Sadiq was the most influential imam since Al Hussein ibn Ali. That's because not only do a majority of Shias follow his law code, but he is also revered among the Sunnis. He was the teacher of the founders of two Sunni schools as well, namely Abu Hanifa, the founder of the Hanifa school, and Malik ibn Unas, the founder of the Maliki school. Many of his followers also founded their own Sufi orders. Sufi Islam being a mystical form of Islam. It's not really its own branch, as Sufis can be found among both Sunnis and Shias. Anyway, Jafar as Sadiq was also a renowned transmitter of hadiths, and many scientific works are attributed to him as well. His death in 765 created yet another schism. It is said that during his lifetime, he had declared his son Ismail to be his successor. However, Ismail died during his lifetime. So there was a question over the succession. Many believed that the successor should now be his other son, Musa, but others believed that the imam was infallible and that therefore the succession should pass from Ismail to Ismail's descendants. Those who followed Musa, later known as Musa al-Kadim, became known as Twelvers, whereas the followers of Ismail and his son Muhammad are known as the Ismailis. During Musa al-Kadim's time, the Abbasids decided to crack down on the descendants of Ali, called Alids, because of a revolt led by an Alid named Muhammad al-Nufs al-Zakiya. He was a descendant of al-Hasan ibn Ali, the second imam. This resulted in a serious breakdown of relations between the Abbasids and the Alids. Musa al-Kadim, along with other Alids had to pay the price. Musa spent prolonged periods of time imprisoned in Baghdad. According to the Twelvers, all 12 Imams were murdered. The first Imam, Ali, was assassinated, and the third Imam, Al Hussein, died in battle. The rest, according to them, were poisoned. For example, Musa al Qadim is said to have died in prison in Baghdad by poisoning. The next imam was Ali al-Rida. At this point, the Abbasid caliph, al-Mamun, tried to repair the relationships between the Alids and the Abbasids. He declared Ali al-Rida to be his heir and even married one of his daughters to him. However, al-Rida died before the caliph. Again, Shias claimed that he was poisoned. The next three imams all led fairly quiet lives with varying degrees of relations with the Abbasids. At Hassan al-Askuri's death in 874, the Twelvers had another succession crisis. Mainstream Twelvers believed in a secret child and heir of al-Askuri named Muhammad, who was later known as Muhammad al-Mahdi. However, he's said to have remained in hiding for his entire life, only publicly communicating through others. For this reason, he is known as the Hidden Imam. From 873 to 941, he is said to have been in minor occultation, which means that he was alive and in hiding. However, in 941, he is said to have gone into what's called major occultation, which means that he's alive through God's will and his life has been prolonged, but he is hidden from everyone and does not communicate. Twelvers believe that he will return from major occultation near the end of time. This is the reason why he's called Al-Mahdi. Al-Mahdi is a messianic figure that was prophesied by Prophet Muhammad to appear near the end of days. Throughout history, various people have claimed to be al-Mahdi. Going back to Hassan al-Askari, at his death, another disciple of his named Ibn Nusayr claimed to be the agent of the hidden imam himself, 
hence breaking away from the mainstream Twelvers. He was excommunicated by them and therefore founded the Alawite sect, which is a very secret branch of Shias found mainly in Syria. Let's now return to Jafar as Sadiq. Remember, upon his death, one group of his followers believed in the imamate of his son Ismail and therefore founded the Ismaili sect. The Ismailis themselves broke into many subgroups. One group believed that the imamate had ended with the son of Ismail, Muhammad ibn Ismail. So they believe in only seven imams. They are known as seveners. The other group claimed that several of the descendants of Ismail went on to become imams, but remained in hiding due to the threat of the Abbasid Caliphate. From 765 to 909, these hidden imams communicated only through agents known as the Da'i. The Da'i formed a secret network of preachers who were trying to win allies for their cause. This changed in 909 when a man named Abdullah ibn al-Hussein declared himself to be the hidden Mahdi. The Da'i broke apart in their support. Some recognized Abdullah, while others rejected him. Among those who rejected him was a man named Humdan Karmat, who founded the Karmatian subsect. The Karmatians are famous for their revolt against the Abbasid Caliphate. They used guerrilla tactics and raided in southern Iraq, eastern Syria, and eastern Arabia. They were mostly hated by almost everyone because they attacked Mecca itself in 930 and stole the sacred black stone. This put a huge target on their back and they were slowly defeated to the point that the order was eventually completely destroyed. But back to Abdullah al-Mahdi. He founded the Fatimid Caliphate, which ruled a large part of North Africa and even the holy cities of Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem. They kept ruling as Caliph Imams until 1094, when there was another succession crisis between two claimants to the throne. One claimant was Nizar, who was arrested and executed by his brother, Al-Mustali. The followers of Nizar are known as Nizaris, while the followers of Al-Mustali are known as the Mustali. The Nizari are famous for two things. The first thing is the assassins who followed the Nizari subsect and acted as an order of trained killers. It's from them that we get the word assassin. The second thing is the Aga Khans, who are currently the imams of the Nizari Ismaili Shias. They claim to be the successors of the Fatimid Caliphs. And this chart here, made by a fan of the channel, shows their family tree. From the first Aga Khan in 1817 to the fourth and current Aga Khan, Shah Karim al-Husseini. Now, while these are some of the major subsects of Shia Islam, there are actually two groups that descend from Shiaism but no longer identify as Muslims. First, there are the Druze, who are quite secretive. They began with two men known as Hamza ibn Ali and Muhammad al-Darazi, who saw the sixth Fatimid Caliph, al-Hakim, as the Mahdi, the great leader who is to appear at the end of days. To them, al-Hakim was even divine. In 1021, al-Hakim disappeared and supposedly went into occultation or hiding. However, according to the Druze, he will return. Another more recent faith to come out of Shia Islam is the Baha'i. It started with a man named Sayyid Ali Muhammad Shirazi, who declared himself to be the door to the hidden imam of the Twelvers. He hence took the name of Bab, which literally means door. Eventually, his claims escalated to the point where he declared himself prophet and even a manifestation of God. He was executed by the Persian government, but Bab had prophesied the appearance of a messianic figure, which would be claimed by a student of his named Baha'u'llah, from whom the Baha'i get their name. He's believed to be the founder of the faith. He spent many years in exile preaching to people and gaining followers. 
He died in 1892, after which the leadership of the group was taken up by his eldest son, Abdul Baha. Nowadays, the supreme ruling body of the Baha'i faith is the nine-member Universal House of Justice, based in Haifa, Israel. Finally, as a bonus, I want to talk a little bit about the Kharijites, the third main sect of Islam, after the Sunnis and Shias. The Kharijites were actually the first sect to branch off. They were strict Puritans who believed in a rigid interpretation of Islam. The name Kharijite comes from the word Kawarij, which means those who left, because they were the people who left Ali's supporters because they didn't want him to negotiate with Muawiyah during the first civil war. To them, negotiating with a man rebelling against a legitimate ruler was prohibited by Islam. And so Ali deserved to die. So they assassinated him. They stayed around being a hassle for various rulers till the year 1000 or so, after which they started to evolve into various more moderate branches, most of which have died out. These days, most Muslims, both Sunni and Shia, think of them as a radical, ultra-conservative, militant cult that is often disassociated from Islam. So much so that religious scholars use the term Kharijite as a derogatory term, but they were a legitimate branch of the religion. Nowadays, they do exist in a moderate version known as the Ibadi, most of whom actually don't like being called Kharijites. Okay, so that was a look at the various branches of Islam, mostly those that exist within Shia Islam. I'm currently working on a chart of Christian denominations, which, as you can imagine, will be pretty big. So keep an eye out for that sometime in the first half of 2023. And don't forget to check out Blinkist by using the link in the description or pinned comment. Thanks for watching.